Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, His praise in the assembly of His faithful people. Let Israel rejoice in their Maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their King. Let them praise His name with dancing, and make music to Him with timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes delight in His people. He crowns the humble with victory. Let His faithful people rejoice in this honor, and sing for joy on their beds. May the praise of God be in their mouths. Our monthly verse for the month of October is found in the book of Colossians chapter 2 verses 6 to 7. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Colossians chapter 2 verses 6 to 7. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. What and why we believe? For what do we pray in the second request? In the second request, your kingdom come, we pray that Satan's kingdom may be destroyed, that the kingdom of grace may be advanced with ourselves and others, brought into and kept in it, and that the kingdom of glory may come quickly. For what do we pray in the second request? In the second request, your kingdom come, we pray that Satan's kingdom may be destroyed, that the kingdom of grace may be advanced with ourselves, and others brought into and kept in it, and that the kingdom of glory may come quickly.
seen or heard Who can grasp your infinite wisdom Who can fathom the depth of your love You are beautiful beyond description Majesty
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we worship you this morning for your greatness. You are our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. You alone are our good shepherd. In you there is life with no lack. You lead us to green pastures and beside still waters. You restore our anxious and weary souls. Even in the darkest valleys we will not fear, for you are right here with us. You are always attentive to us. You provide for us. You guide us. You watch behind us. And you go before us. We find safety, comfort, peace, and joy in your omnipotent and loving, scared hands. We cast our cares on you, for you care for us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. As your dependent and expectant children, we come to you with humble hearts. We ask you to protect our family, our congregation, our city, our nation, and the global community in this time of a global pandemic. We ask for your grace and mercy on the most vulnerable among us, those most physically vulnerable, emotionally vulnerable, and economically vulnerable. Grant our frontliners protection from illness and give them extra strength and resilience. We pray for our local and national government leaders and business leaders that you would grant them great wisdom and strength to protect and sustain our economy. We pray that you would equip Pastor Vincent to preach the word with power. Preaching is only effective because the word is effective. So let his message be consistent with your word. Enable us to be attentive and eager to hear, trusting that in each preaching, we are not just hearing the words of man, but the truth of God. We pray that we would set aside whatever distractions or concerns we have in our hearts today. Enable us to listen with eagerness and be changed. Let us be ever more conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our sermon passage for this morning is found in the book of First Peter, chapter 2, verses 12 to 20. Live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. Submit yourselves, for the Lord's sake, to every human authority, whether to the emperor as to the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by Him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Slaves in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. Well, it's good to be with you once again, even though it's by video. It's been many weeks since the last time uh, I was at UCC Church. And to come to you this morning and be able to address you from God's Word is such a great privilege. Uh, things have changed for our family. We are now back in the U.S. for at least a little while, for maybe about a year. Uh, we were um, We departed from the Philippines back in June and made our way here to South Carolina, and we um, are now living with my wife's parents, and uh, this is where I'm making the video in their home. And um, Pastor Billy asked me if I would uh, preach this week, and uh, I took him up on the offer and said, yes, I can do that, and, and he's told me that you're in First Peter. It's a wonderful book, uh, the book of First Peter. And, and I've also agreed to preach periodically um, over the next year, we don't know what's going to happen with the lockdowns or with the 
uh, kind of the stay at home orders or the quarantine uh, in regards to the coronavirus. It's affected the world. And, um, and so we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how the country may open up. And, but at this point, uh, you're taking it a week at a time, a day at a time, and it's difficult to be able to have everyone together uh, because the virus can spread very easily and you have to be very, very careful. And so at this point, we're still meeting online. Even my church, Life Field, is meeting online. And um, we're still doing that um, on a weekly basis. And so it's just that's the way it is. But it's it's good that we can still come together and, and hear from God's Word and hear the truth of God's Word. In the passage we have before us today, it's 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 12 is where um, uh, I'm going to pick up and start. Uh, going down through verse 20. That's going to be our passage for this morning. And the book of Peter, 1 Peter, is, is written, as you know, by the Apostle Peter to Christians who have been scattered throughout the region of Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. Um, that's how we would know of it today. But it's that region where these Christians lived. And, and what was true about them is that they were suffering persecution. You most likely already know about that based on just what you know about the letter so far. Um, how far uh, you've been able to get through the letter and in, in up to this point. The, the Christians were, were, were suffering because of, uh, of their faith in Christ. Because they named the name of Christ. Because they stood for Jesus. Because they, uh, they claimed to be born again. They claimed to have new faith and new life in Jesus Christ. It, it, it brought about a level of persecution that they had previously maybe not had um, received. It changed their life. Yes, coming to Christ changed their life for the better. It, 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 it put them on the right path. They would now go to heaven. Their sins had been forgiven. But it also brought about circumstantial changes where now they're being persecuted for their faith. Because they believe in Jesus, <laughs> now everybody's angry at them. And, and you can go back and, and look at the history of how all this came about and, and what led to all of the persecution. But God told us, our Lord told us, He said, if they hated me, they'll hate you. You'll be despised. You'll be hated because of your relationship to me. But that's okay. Take cheer. Be, be of good heart. Be of good courage. I know this is what's going to happen to you. I know what's going to take place. I, I know that you're going to suffer. But that's okay. That's okay. And when Peter writes this letter, he, he writes this letter these, these chapters to encourage the brethren, to encourage the brothers and sisters in Christ living in these places, these towns, these cities in the region of Asia Minor, to do one thing, to encourage them and bring comfort to them and give them an eternal perspective on the situation that they're facing. To help them see, take a step back and say, yes, I know you're suffering. And Peter, he was used to suffering. Read the book of Acts. He knows what it's, he knows what it means to be persecuted. That, he's not a stranger to that. So he writes not just from his, from the Lord leading him and guiding him, he also writes from his experience. He, he writes out of, of how the Lord had led and guided him throughout his life. Peter spoke truth. And this letter is, is all about providing that level of encouragement to the believers. That's what it's for. And in the particular section that we're looking at, verse 12 to verse 20, Peter focuses in on a very specific issue. That it's one thing to have a perspective on what you're facing. Okay, how bad is the persecution? How severe will it be? It's, it's also another thing to say, okay, I want to encourage you to walk with Christ or to, to stay focused on Him in the midst of all that persecution. 
And Peter will talk about that. But in the specific passage that we're looking at this morning, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12 to 20, he, he, he touches on something that you need to be aware of. Something very important. Especially when you're being persecuted for your faith. It is this. Is this. You need to make sure that even if you're being persecuted, meaning you're facing difficult times, meaning that there are people who don't like you, who are treating you evil, treating you in a bad way because of who you are in Christ. You're feeling the weight of the world on you. You're feeling the, 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 the evil and the anger of the world upon you. And Peter says, when that is happening, when that is taking place, you still are required by the Lord to have a submissive attitude. You see, when people come against you, when people speak against you, people hate you because of who you are in Christ. When they, when they malign you and, 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 and literally mess up your life, what's the first thing you want to do? I'll tell you exactly what you want to do. You want to say to your, you want to say to them, I have five reasons, five reasons why I'm going to teach you a thing or two. I'm going to put you in your place. Don't you speak like that to me. When we're persecuted. When we're attacked. Because of who we are in Christ. The normal thing that we would want to do is defend ourselves. To speak up for ourselves. And Peter says... Let me give you a different understanding on how you should respond to persecution. When the evil comes at you, when the evil attacks you, there, there's, a, there's a different perspective you need to have. There, there's a different perspective that, that you need to think about. You need to look at it differently, not look at it like the world would look at it, and not respond like the world would respond. Your life needs to be different. Your attitude needs to be different. Your, your, the way you live needs to be different. And what Peter wants to focus on here is that we need to have a submissive attitude, which is very difficult for us to do. He's challenging us here. He's encouraging us here, but he's also challenging us. He's basically stating, this is how it better be. Imagine these Christians in this area of, of Asia Minor, and they're and they're they're under persecution. You you want to just say, you know what? Rise up and get a get a sword and go out and fight these people who are coming against you. Stand up for yourself. Tell them off. Peter has a different perspective. Peter is thinking differently. Have you ever been attacked? Maligned? Maybe they don't physically attack you, but they speak evil of you, laugh at you, post bad things about you on Facebook? How are you going to respond to all that? Especially if they're attacking you because of your faith in Christ. How are you going to do that? How are you going to respond to that? You have to be submissive. You have to be submissive. You have to have a submissive attitude. And, and, and so this is what Peter's going to talk about. And so let me read this passage to you. Let me um, get it before you so that you have a, um, an idea of what Peter's saying, and then we're going to look at it. Starting in verse 12 of 1 Peter chapter 2, he says this, Having your conversation or your behavior, having your conversation or behavior honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, 
whether it be to the king as supreme or unto the governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as free men being servants of God. So honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Then he says in verse 18, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward, to those who are obstinate. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults or attacked for your, for, for faults, you take it patiently? But if when you do well, and you suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. So Peter starts out in verse 12 and he says, make sure that your behavior, make sure that your behavior is honest among the Gentiles. The idea is um, those who would persecute you, those who would attack you, in other words, your fellow men, and the reason he says among the Gentiles is he's actually talking more to Gentiles. He could be in this by in this book, in this letter. The point he's trying to make is make sure that your behavior is honest. See, they're going to speak against you as an evildoer. And by the way, you may hear noises in the background. Um... This is the middle of the day for me, and um, and so things are taking place in this house, and so you may hear noises. That's okay. Just stay with me, okay? Um, so he says, I want your conversation. I want your behavior to be honest. I want you to be, um, that your yes be yes, your nay be nay. That's what Jesus would say. Because even in when they speak evil against you, they treat you like you're an evildoer. They treat you like you're the scum of the earth. They treat you like you're a bad person. They still may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day that God visits them. And what's Peter saying here? He says, listen, no matter how they treat you, no matter how evil they treat you, no matter if they treat you like you're an evildoer, no matter how much wickedness they throw at you, You cannot respond in kind. You can't return evil for evil. You can't go back at them and lash back at them and say, here's my five reasons. You can't do that. You can't do that. Your behavior has to be honest, has to be straightforward, has to be consistent with biblical teaching. The way you respond in that moment of when wickedness comes at you, how you respond will be very important because Peter says you don't want to lose the opportunity that that is a teachable moment, that that is an evangelistic moment. See, the world doesn't care about Christ. It doesn't care about his, tr his truth. It doesn't care about scripture. It, doesn't, it does not have a biblical worldview. They don't think that way. And we cannot assume that they will think that way. They don't understand the inerrancy of Scripture. They don't understand what it means to be born again. They don't understand. They have no conception of what it really means to have new life in Christ. They don't get it. They're operating from a sinful pattern. They're operating from a sinful worldview. A worldview they created of their own making. No matter what form or fashion it may come. And so when you come there, you're in the room, you're representing Christ in a biblical worldview, and it's contrary to whatever worldview they came up with. Let me tell you something. They're not going to like it. They're not going to like who you are. They're not, they may be pleasant to you. They may smile to you. But deep down, they don't agree with your worldview. They don't agree with your position. They don't agree with, with what you believe. 
to them it's either foolishness, this whole gospel thing, or they may think that you're really the ignorant one. They don't get it. And they may even attack you for it. They may treat you like you're the work, most wicked person in the room. But you know what you do? It's not that you stop them from acting wickedly. You can't stop them. You don't have that power. But what you do have the power to do through the power of the Holy Spirit is how you respond to it. And Peter says, you need to have be honest in your behavior so that by your good deeds, which they will behold it, they will see it, they will give glory to God in the day of visitation or the day God visits them. You say, what is the day of that? What is the day of visitation? It could be one of two things. It can be when God comes to visit them in their moment of salvation. And that's a good thing, right? God's in charge of salvation. And it could be, it can reference, that when God does something good in their life and visits them with salvation and grace and mercy, and they give glory to God. And God used your life as an example to them. Remember the Apostle Paul? You know, when he was in Rome, under house arrest, he talks about this in the book of Philippians. He's under house arrest and he says, those in the Praetorian Guard greet you. You say, what does he mean by that? Who are the Praetorian Guard? Well, when Paul was under house arrest, he had a chain around his neck, around his, sorry, uh, around his wrist. And, and on the other end of the chain was a Roman guard, a, a soldier guard. And he had the chain on his wrist. And for six hours a day, that guard was attached to the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul had freedom. He could walk around. He could go around. He could visit with people. He could even teach the Bible. But every six hours, a new Roman guard was chained up to the Apostle Paul. And you may look at that and say, oh, poor Apostle Paul. He's chained up to a Roman guard. No privacy. No time of his own. Think of it this way. Poor Roman guard. Because who was he chained up to? The Apostle Paul. You know what happened? Some of those Roman guards came to faith in Christ. Those wicked men who could easily just strike Paul down with a sword. They heard the message of the gospel. They saw Paul's life. And Paul says to the, to the Philippian church, those in the Praetorian Guard greet you. They send their blessings to you. Some of these soldiers are coming to faith in Christ. What a jail ministry that is. Peter is saying, listen, no matter where you're at, no matter how, how they treat you as evildoers, you got to live your life in consistent with spiritual truth. Live it in consistent with spiritual truth so that when God visits them on their day of salvation, God uses your life as a testimony to bring them to faith. But the day of visitation can also mean something negative. It can be when God meets them in judgment. It could mean that too. And they still will give glory to God. When they're standing before God at the great white throne, about ready to go into eternal judgment, eternal fire, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. You have to think about it. You can't return evil for evil. You gotta live, you can't live a perfect life. But even when you're attacked, it's an opportunity, a greater opportunity to live for the Lord. To demonstrate and shine the love of Christ. Christ went to the cross, suffered, and died for you and I. He could have come down from that cross. He had the power to do that, but he willingly was, was suffered and died so that we might be saved. And if he suffered, so will we have to. But what Peter does here is he makes that point about having your behavior be straightforward and honest and biblical and, 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 and that your life can be used by God as a testimony, either for those who come to faith and those who go to judgment. But then he gets specific and he says, you want to know how? Let me, let me give you some examples of how your life 
can demonstrate those good deeds. How your life, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of what you're facing, how you can demonstrate what it means to live for the Lord, even in the midst of turmoil. And he, and he focuses on two areas. Area number one, he says, you need to be submissive to the governing authorities. Okay? And we'll look, we'll look at that in just a minute. Secondly, you need to be submissive to your master or for our, the way it would under, understand this, to our employer. So, these are, your employer and your government are what we call civic areas of life, right? The, the social areas of life. You got you to gotta work to make money. So you got, you got some boss over you, right? And, and then, <clears throat> unless you are the boss, <laughs> I guess some, some of you may be the boss. You know, you have people you, or who are, you're over, who are under you. But at some point, you, gotta, you answer to somebody. Um, but having an employment is a common area of life. Well, you also live in a world that has a government. You live somewhere geographically. You're in the Philippines. There is a government. You may not agree with the government. You may not like the president. You may not like the congressman. And, and if what I've been seeing on the news recently, I mean, they're, they're having some interesting days, not just related to the coronavirus. Even in America, where I'm at, I mean, we're, we're getting close to an election. And you got different, different governments, federal government, state government, local governments. And what does Peter say? Let me show you how you respond when those who treat you evil as evildoers. I'll tell you who treats you as an evildoer. The government can do that, and so can your employer. How are you going to respond? How is your how are you how are you going to deal with this? Let me give you an example of how you how, how you flesh this out. Example number one, how do you live for the Lord in the midst of persecution? How do you have that submissive attitude uh, before the Lord and follow him? Number one, you got to submit to the governing authorities. Submit to your government. That's example number one. Submit yourselves, he says, to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king. So if an ordinance comes from the king, do it. Or unto the governor. Those would be lower than the king. As, is, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. And for the praise that do well, of them that do well. This is the will of God. That with well doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. He said, listen. I'll tell you how this works. If your government goes against you, the last thing you want to do is submit. I'm going to rebel. I, they can't stop me. I don't like the government. I don't like what they do. I hate that. I'm going to despise that. They better not. They made her. They better not treat me evil. And if they do, well, I'm going to let them have it. I have my rights. Peter says, listen. Put down the fist. Put it down. Put it away. The Lord is supreme, right? Yes. Does the Lord control everything? Is He sovereign in this world? Yes. And guess what the Lord did? The Lord's goal in life is not to please you in everything. You see? Your goal in life is to please the Lord. But it's not the Lord's goal to please every, your every wish and desire. Otherwise, you're, you're selfish, right? That's selfishness. And so the Lord provides government. And you may not like who the government is. You may not like the president. You may not like the governing officials. You may think that there could be somebody better. Who could be a better president in a, in a better Congress. And if your government allows you to have a right to vote for that, so be it. When Peter was writing this, there was no such thing as democracy. There was no such thing as voting. The king and the governors were all dictators. 
the king is Caesar. And it wouldn't be too many years that Peter would lose his head and Nero, who was a crazy man, would be the king. But Peter saying the same thing that Paul would say in the book of Romans. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Period. Doesn't matter if it's the king or a governor or those sent by the governor for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those that do well. That would be your local police. Your Roman guards in that day. See, there's different levels of of governmental structure. You know it as well as I do. And the point is, is that we need to submit ourselves. You say, well, the government, they don't, they don't do right by, by God's standards. Never expected them to. The government has been given by the Lord. The Lord has set that up. But it doesn't mean that they follow a biblical worldview. It doesn't mean they follow the biblical pattern. It doesn't mean that they're all believers. They're of the world. You say, wait a minute. If they attack me for my Christian beliefs, I'm sorry. But I have to, I, I will not follow it. Peter says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Whether it be to the king or to governors or those sent by the governors, the police. Why does he say that? Because this is the will of God. Verse 15. This is the will of God. The will of God would say, follow this. The will of God would say, do this. The will of God would say that this is what you are to do. That with well doing, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Who are the foolish men? The foolish men are those who would want to rebel against the government, fight against the government, take the government out. I'm tired of them talking to me like this. I demand my rights. The foolish men are the ones who would not realize that God has sanctioned government in the first place. And it doesn't mean that government's going to respond to every situation in a biblical way. We cannot expect that. We would hope for it, but we cannot expect it. The government has a, has a, has a job to do, and it, it's a job that God has created for them to do. Why? Because you have society living in sin, and, and if there's no restraint to it, you, you're going to have murder and mayhem and anarchy. Here in America, there are those who want to defund the police. They want to get rid of the police. They're tired of the police. Well, what do you have in its place? If you get rid of the police, what do you have? You have anarchy. Can't get rid of the police. There's nobody to control the evil of man. And you say, well, my cup, what about when the government is corrupt? Well, yeah, it's not good. It's not good to have a corrupt government. No, it's not. But your job in life is not to fix the government. That's not your job. That's not what God has called you to do. God has called you to live for Him. God has called you and placed you here to live for Him, to manifest Him, to shine forth His radiance. So don't listen to the foolish men. And even when they treat you like an evildoer, submit to their, submit to their ordinances. You may not agree with it. You may not even like it. But God will honor you in it. And even if obeying their ordinance means that you may have to you may you may have to sacrifice your life do it he says as free you say well man i'm not free i'm under this government order i'm under this government situation <laughs> yeah but really as free in christ he's talking about Freedom from sin. As free, be a servant of God. Follow the Lord. 
Don't don't look at freedom in Christ as a way to use your liberty as a cloak for maliciousness. This is not God allowing you to be malicious towards the government. We can't do that. You need to follow them. You need to obey by their ordinances. God has set that up that way. This is the will of God. So you need to honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. If you truly say you fear God, you will also honor the king. You will love each other, and you'll honor all men even if they don't agree with you. You see, we have a problem in our world with lack of love, right? Hatred. You can't have hatred in your heart for those that even treat you spitefully and 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 do evil towards you. What did Jesus say? Pray for those who persecute you. Bless them. Pray, pray for them. Who despitefully treat you. You say, wait a minute. What if the government tells me to stop, to, 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 to renounce my faith? And, and what if they tell me to, to stop preaching the gospel? Well, we have a scripture in that in Acts. There may come to a point where you have to obey God rather than man. And that is true. But even if that comes, and that case is very, that, that example in Acts it's not that that's a, a law. Go and do that likewise. You're learning. That's a story. That's a narrative. That's a, an event that took place. And we learn something from it. And what we learn from that is that when you look at the context of that, the apostles were being stopped or hindered from preaching the gospel. They were being told by the religious leaders of that day, you cannot preach in the name of Christ. And they're like, no, 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 no. We're gonna, we're gonna, we have to speak truth. We have to speak the, the, the salvation, the gospel of Christ. We cannot stay silent when it comes to that. That's when Peter said, it's a, yeah, we, we gotta obey God rather than you. And we're willing to suffer the consequences of that. Even when they were saying that to them, they weren't being malicious. They weren't doing that with a malicious attitude, with, with a bad attitude. They were saying, this is what God requires us to do. You probably are familiar with maybe what's happening with Grace Community Church and John MacArthur and those kinds of things and uh, in Southern California because of the health ordinances. And technically, their church, legally, their church is breaking the health ordinance, the stated health ordinance of the land. Of, of Southern California, of L.A. County, where their church is located. Because people are gathering, they're congregating, they're not socially distancing, they're not wearing masks, and the health ordinance says that you cannot have so many people gathered together in one place and you know all the, all the restrictions. And MacArthur's, they're meeting every Sunday. Every Sunday they're meeting. And you may be asking yourself, are, are they not... Are they not submitting? Are they violating 1 Peter 2, chapter 2, verse 13? Well, see, they have come to the conclusion that it's time to obey God rather than man. And the debate here among even the Christians is, have we reached that point yet? I don't want to deal with that in this lesson. I've dealt with that in another another time or two. Um... But Peter's point is this. You can't be malicious towards the government, even if it's the government that's being attacking you for your faith in Christ. You can't be malicious to them. The foolish men are the ones that are malicious. The foolish ones are the ones who attack. You have to live a submissive life. Why? Because when God visits the government, the day of their visitation, he may bring some like the Praetorian Guard to faith in Christ and others. He will use your life and the way you lived and the example of godliness that you demonstrated as judgment upon them. That's one example. That is one example. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. That's how you live for the Lord. 
That's how you that's how you have an honest behavior among the Gentiles, verse 12. That's one way of showing it. A submissive attitude to the government. Another one, though, is submissive attitude to your employer. And in that day, they would be called servants and masters. And literally, slaves in those days, it wasn't like slavery in America as much, but slavery, slaves, people were indentured servants because they owed a bill, they owed a debt. And most of the time they had to work for um, someone because of that. Sometimes it was um, you're paying off a debt or you may have been a hired worker and you worked for some employer. This was a work relationship. And he says in verse 18, servants. So he's addressing the servants, the employee, be subject to your masters with all fear. And it's not the fear of, I'm afraid of them, but it's the fear of, it means respect, with all respect. Now, there are masters who are good and gentle. Okay? And those are easy to be subject to, be submissive to, to do the work that you're required to do. I would always say, be a, if you're an employer, be a good one. Demonstrate the love of the Lord, even as an employer, to other people. They depend upon you for their for their livelihood, for their for the income that you are able to give them as an employer, so that they can put food on their on the table and pay the bills for their family. And they work for you, so be good to them. Don't treat them evil. But not every employer is good. Not every master was good. There were those who were, it's listed here as the froward. These were the evil ones. These were the taskmaster types. These were the ones that looked down upon their servants, looked down upon their slaves, looked down upon their employees, and said, and said you know what, I'm better than you. And they didn't pay them well, they didn't treat them well, didn't feed them well. You know, I've heard stories about how house helpers, the Kasim Baha'i, the house helpers, how they are mistreated, how they can't eat the food that the family gets for themselves, they have to eat a different kind of food, and, you know, things like that. They're not given a living wage Sometimes they're treated very badly. And, and as believers, that we should never treat an employee of any kind of spectrum in our life, especially for an employer. We should, do, we should do everything in our power with all the blessings that God has given us to treat them well. But, but what Peter is dealing with is not really that issue. He's talking about it from the employee issue and says, no matter if, you're, if your master, your employer is good to you or not, you need to be submissive. You need to be submissive. This is thankworthy. This is given thanks. If a man for conscience towards God, he, he paints a hypothetical, okay? Think about this. If a man, man or woman here, if a person for conscience towards God, you endure grief, you suffer wrongfully, okay? Then it, be thankful for that. It's thankworthy for a man Conscious toward God, enduring grief, suffering, even wrongfully. Then he says this. Think about it this way. For what glory is it? For what really do you get? Do you gain? If you're buffeted or you suffer because of your own faults. Even if you take it patiently. Even if you're dealing, you know, let's say you've done wrong. You've been the wrongdoer. And you suffer for it. Okay. And, you, and when you suffer, you suffer very patiently for the wrongdoing that you have done. But, if you do well, and not deserving of any suffering, but you still suffer for it, and you take it patiently, you know what? That's acceptable with God. The point Peter's trying to make is an argument from the lesser to the greater. You know, even if you did your own faults, you had to suffer for it, it's good to suffer patiently. But if so there's a higher glory here. There's a better situation here. When, when If you don't do bad, but do well, you're 
you're a good employee, you're doing everything you can, you're not perfect, nobody is, but you're living for the Lord, living for His truth, and you're trying to serve your employer, and they treat you bad, malicious, evil, and you still will to take their suffering and even take it patiently. You don't respond evil for evil. You don't, you don't take out vengeance upon your employer. Even when they treat you with disrespect, that is acceptable with God. That's acceptable. You say, wait a minute. If, I, if evil is done to me by the government or by my employer, I'm going to... You can't respond evil for evil. Evil done to you, you cannot respond with evil back. Why? Because your life has been changed. You've been saved. Did Christ respond that way? No. Christ could have sent down legions of angels to destroy the religious leaders, to destroy all those people who would attack him. Did he do it? No. Even when he had the power. And that's what Peter's going to say, and you'll look at this next week. We've been called to suffering. Christ has suffered for us. He's left us an example that we should follow his steps. You're going to uh, look at that more deeply next week. But the, here's the thing. Christ has suffered for us. Him and all his power, he didn't do any wrong. He's perfect and still was willing to suffer even though he did everything perfectly well. We don't do everything perfectly well. The point Peter's trying to make is how you respond to persecution is important. How you respond to evil that is done to you is important. And even in the midst of persecution, the bigger issue here is that you're a servant of God. You're a servant of Christ. You are, he is your ultimate master. And you are to demonstrate his Christ likeness, his likeness in this world, no matter who sees it. The government your employers, the secular world, the Gentiles, no matter who it is, you demonstrate godliness, love, mercy, kindness, compassion, humility. You exude that as much as possible. As much as possible. People still may not understand they still may not like you. They still may treat you evil. It's not going to change maybe how they respond to you and how they treat you. But it will ultimately matter when God visits them. And God will visit them either in salvation, which is a praise, or in judgment. God will take care of it. God will right every wrong. What does the Bible say? Vengeance is mine. You want to know why you don't repay evil for evil? Because God says, I will take care of it. Vengeance is mine. Vengeance is not yours. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. I will take care of it. That's not your place. Don't stress yourself out over trying to correct every wrong by solving every societal ill. You can't do it. It's not your job. It's not what God has called you to do. God has called you to live for Him. God has called you to manifest who He is in this world. And no matter how bad it gets, you can demonstrate His righteousness, His truth, His glory in this world. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a wonderful truth? Especially for today. The coronavirus has upset the whole thing. It has messed up the world. It has changed your life. It has changed your work. It has changed everything. It's closed down many of our churches from meeting. And somebody wants to blame somebody for it. Honestly, God has allowed it. I don't like it either. I wish the coronavirus would have never come, but it did. It arrived. And we have to respond appropriately. We have to respond as the Lord would have us respond to it, and that is loving Him 
and show kindness to others. Show kindness and love to others because the love of Christ that reigns through us. And there will come a day when all this will be over. There will come a day when we won't even live in this world anymore, tainted by sin. But until that day comes, let's live for the Lord. Let's live for Him. Let's manifest His righteousness to a lost and dying world. Dear Lord, we do give you thanks again for today, for our time together. Lord, we pray your blessing be upon us. Lord, thank you for all that you do for us, even in the midst of a, a pandemic, even in the midst of suffering. Lord, you are our, 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 our Lord and our God. And Lord, we love you. And we desire above everything else to manifest who you are in this world to those who do not know you. As a testimony of your grace, as a testimony of your mercy, and that when you visit them, you can take care of what needs to be done in that person's life. Thank you for giving us this time in your word. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are a regular member of UCC Church and you wish to give through bank deposit or bank transfer, here are our bank details. Kindly email deposit slip or transfer confirmation receipt to write to uccc at gmail.com. Let me repeat, write to uccc at gmail.com. UCC Church, we will have an online Bible study via Zoom app on Friday, 8 p.m. Registration, meeting ID, and meeting password will be posted on Messenger. Thank you. Our speaker for next Sunday is Pastor Keith Ibrahim. We confess the mystery and wonder of God made flesh and rejoice in our great salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. With the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Son created all things, sustains all things, and makes all things new. Truly God, He became truly man, two natures in one person. He was born of the Virgin Mary and lived among us, crucified, dead, and buried. He rose on the third day, ascended to heaven, and will come again in glory and judgment. For us, he kept the law, atoned for sin, and satisfied God's wrath. He took our filthy rags and gave us his righteous robe. He is our prophet, priest, and king. Building his church 
interceding for us and reigning over all things. Jesus Christ is Lord. We praise his holy name forever. Amen. Loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers, for feeding us with your word, and for encouraging us this morning. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, receive God's blessing. Amen and Amen. service ends here. Don't forget to answer the survey. We posted the links on the description below. God bless everybody.